Mid-February, COVID-19 found Singapore's weak spot. For these men, a land of opportunity. Singapore has been nothing short of a nightmare. Okay, it is time. It is time to make this video. It's time to dress the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the foreign migrant workers of Singapore and the role that they had in building up this country and the way that they're currently being treated. So I have a growing list of videos that I want to make this year. Like. It, it just, they just keep coming out of my head and I'm so excited about them. And I've now made two videos on the island state of Singapore. The first one I released at the end of 2019, which was all about is Singapore the perfect city. Um, to date, that's still one of my favorite videos on this channel. And then the second one I released like two weeks ago and it was talking about how Singapore is beating COVID-19. And it's pretty much an exception for me to make two videos on one place, let alone free. But the response from you guys has been insane. Like you guys love these Singapore videos so much. I mean, look at this. Singapore, Singapore. Do you guys just love these videos on Singapore? And there's been so many comments and what I enjoy most about them is they've been really interesting and thought provoking and they've sent me down many different paths. And with all that being said, I've decided to make a series on this YouTube channel dedicated to Singapore. So before we continue, make sure you subscribe to this channel because there's gonna be more Singapore content coming in the next few weeks. Okay, on with today's video. So something important to know about Singapore is that all of this did not exist 60 years ago. 60 years ago, Singapore looked more like this. And even Marina Bay Sands, which has become an iconic image of the Singapore skyline, didn't exist until 2010. The point is, they don't mess around and they've done a lot in the past 56 years since their independence from Malaysia. But here's the thing, Singapore has zero resources. Everything is important, including a large portion of their labor-intensive workforce, aka the people that built Singapore. Foreign workers that mainly come to Singapore from South Asian countries like India and Bangladesh. There are currently around 400,000 foreign workers living in Singapore, which actually makes up about 20% of the country's population. They work long hours in their labor heavy jobs with low wages and the majority of them live within these confined dormitories. There's around 40 to 50 of these dormitories around Singapore. And sometimes these rooms can sleep up to 20 different people. 20 different people in these rooms sharing the same bathroom and living space. And there's been general apprehension about housing Singapore's workers with the rest of the country's residents. But the pandemic has really shone a new spotlight on the issue with these dormitories. And that's where I really wanna focus our attention today. In my last video about how Singapore is beating COVID-19, I mentioned the vast majority of Singapore's positive cases have come from its young migrant workers dormitories. So this footage here is taken from a worker inside the dormitories. Here on room, another room. So center here is our kitchen. When is it there? One was here. <laughs> this is what it's like living in one of these dormitories. You can kind of see how this happened. You can see how this spread. Look at the size of these living quarters. And then when the outbreak happened, they were confined to their dorms. In April, they just had to stay inside. They couldn't go anywhere else. These vulnerable communities are underpaid. They're poorly looked after. And they've had a massive impact on helping the country grow to the size that it is today. Catherine James, executive director of Home, a Singapore-based charity, said that it has also exposed a systematic weakness relating to the lack of access to healthcare, and more worryingly, the reluctancy to report abuse or violations, fearing retaliation from their employees. And this fear has bred a compliant migrant workforce, which finds it difficult to assert its rights for better working and living conditions. And we're now seeing the effect of this play out during the coronavirus outbreak. So there's that, and then let's look at Singapore itself. Singapore is one of the most expensive places to live in the world, yet there is next to no homelessness in Singapore. The Housing and Development Board ensures that everybody has a place to live, and 80% of the population live in public housing. And in Singapore, there is no social stigma around the word public housing, like you find in other parts of the world. In Singapore, the rich and poor live in the same buildings together. And Singapore is home to a lot of expats and people from all around the world. So my question is why can't these migrant workers also live in these houses or have the same quality of life? Now, in the aftermath of coronavirus in the dormitories and the human rights violations that have been made, the government have decided to act. 
and they've come in and they said that they will make changes and each worker will have his own living quarters by the end of the year. They also announced that all migrant workers would be vaccinated by the end of the year on the same timeline as everybody else in Singapore. To me, that should just be happening anyway. If they're living and working in Singapore, they should be treated the same way. There's clearly some unbalance here, but that's what the government is saying. This is a weird one, but I also feel like I should say that they're also giving them these tourist vouchers to go on the Singapore flyer, which is, um, I mean, that wouldn't fix the issue for me. And it's worrying to think that if the pandemic didn't happen or it didn't get to this level, would this situation have been addressed? It should have been addressed before this. We have to look at this as a step forward and change is starting to happen. But for the 400,000 migrant workers living in Singapore, their future is still surrounded in uncertainty, even after the eradication of COVID-19 because of the economic impact and the massive blow on the construction industry. There will have to be a big social and economic change to a rethink of how they're treated with the standards of living being raised and wages increased. And furthermore, why can't these workers be housed and live within the rest of the Singaporean society? And with these workers essentially being confined to their living spaces last year to try and prevent the spread of COVID-19, experts have said that it is essentially a sacrifice that these workers have made for the rest of Singapore's society to continue. That they owe a debt of gratitude and concrete change to these workers after the pandemic is over. Hey guys, thanks for making it all the way to the end of this video. I know this was a little bit of a different tone to my other ones. I also spoke to different people in Singapore about this topic to try and gather as much information as possible. But if you live in Singapore, I'd also love to hear your thoughts on the situation with the migrant workers and what you think could and hopefully will change after the pandemic is over. So like I said, there's gonna be more of these videos coming, so make sure you subscribe. And if you wanna see some more behind the scenes of what's going on and how I make these videos, you can follow me on Instagram at Andy Burgess. So that's about it. Thank you for watching, stay safe, and I will see you guys in the next one.